Good afternoon and welcome to Radio Irava on CHUO 89.1 FM in Ottawa, CHUO.FM and RadioIrava.com worldwide. My name is Nargis. Today is December 1st, 2013. My guest today is Mr. Morris Vallecott, a member of the Canadian Parliament from the Conservative Party. Last week, after Mr. Vallecott met with Iranian Canadians on hunger strike in Ottawa in front of the U.S. Embassy, I had the chance and honor to discuss the hunger strike in Camp Liberty by the hundreds and ways to echo their voices in Canada with him. Good afternoon, Mr. Morris Vallecott. Welcome to Radio Irava, and thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me. You bet. It's a real privilege to be on, on your show today, and I look forward to uh, some discussion that we can have on some pretty important issues uh, pertaining to friends and comrades over in uh, Camp Liberty, but in behalf of uh, Iranian Canadians here as well. Exactly. As you know, September 1st attack on unarmed residents of Camp Ashraf, who were supposed to be protected by U.S. and U.N. and the Iraqi government, has resulted in an international campaign to free the seven hostages who were taken on that day by the Iraqi forces. I'd like to know what impact it has had on Canadian parliamentarians such as yourself. Well, I think it should have more impact, if, if you will, across the country than it actually has. Uh, Narji's mm-hmm. a real disappointment in terms of, uh, e- even internationally, that the media are not covering the story to the extent it should be. Um, but as a member of parliament, a uh, member of the Canadian parliament, we obviously want to keep an eye on things abroad and elsewhere, uh, and particularly as we find out about that stuff firsthand through uh, friends and acquaintances uh, in the country here, some of our dear Iranian uh, friends who have family members back there that were directly uh, involved or assaulted, um, and, and there's those ties and those connections. So we, I think, have a responsibility uh, because the world is a much smaller place today, mm-hmm. and if we're not careful about trying to protect the rights and freedoms and the dignity of people abroad, then uh, there's a curtailment of that coming closer home to us here. And so it's on our conscience to actually uh, make sure we're looking out for people abroad elsewhere, because in effect, it'll come to us if we don't defend those people now. Uh, I I thought it was just horrific in terms of the awful assault that occurred and the uh, massacre of those uh, 50 some people there mm-hmm. and actually that it wasn't known as a possibility and there was kind of hints and uh, uh, kind of inferences that that might occur so there was some pre-warning if you will about this kind of catastrophe happening and in fact uh, very tragically it came to pass. Mr. Vallecott, what I'm hearing is that just talking about the f- September 1st attack on Ashraf residents is not enough. What do you think we can do as Canadians? Well, I think as Canadians, uh, anybody hearing this uh, radio show obviously would want to make sure that they're in touch with their local politician, their member of parliament, I guess the provincial uh, member of the provincial parliament as well, but particularly their federal member of parliament, and then go on to the Elections Canada website and just putting in their postal code can find who that that member of parliament is, whatever party, be they conservative, liberal, uh, NDP, and they should uh, bring that to the attention of the member of parliament, their staff, and say this is a, an ongoing concern of ours. There's mm-hmm. seven hostages being held in the dark dungeons there in Iraq, and we don't know what the fortune or fate of these people are. It's awfully foreboding, and there has not been a proper address to the uh, dreadful massacre of 50-plus people that occurred back in September either. So. Uh, United Nations is still kind of trying to do their investigation of that. I think I think there's been some some fairly uh, explicit allegations of uh, complicity, if you will, between the Iraqi regime and the uh, Iranian, uh, be it Quds mm-hmm. Force or other elements there, in terms of this kind of thing happening. Because there's it's uh, as I understand it, it's uh, out. Uh, uh, at a place where you you could see this stuff coming at you, it's not like it's a hidden just over the hill, and there you can attack attack the city of uh, Camp Ashraf. But uh, th- this was complicity at the highest levels of those governments. It would seem uh, these so are the allegations, and I think credibly. And yet the UN, I don't know that they've come uh, to authorizing any kind of definitive report on that. So I think the public, the members of parliament, need to be contacted across Canada. Uh, in the U.S., because the U.S. has uh, a great responsibility, a signed promise right. to protect those there at uh, Ashraf and Liberty. And uh, we're not so sure that the follow-through is happening on that either. Mr. Velikot, you have talked to some of the protesters who are on hunger strike in front of the U.S. Embassy here in Ottawa and heard their concerns. Can you share their concerns with us, please? 
Well, I, I had the uh, privilege last Friday, in fact, of uh, being with some of these dear people, uh, some of whom have relatives over there, uh, a, a son at Camp Liberty, a niece, uh, various relatives, close, uh, close relations there. Mm -hmm. And so these were dear folk that came in, Canadians from, uh, you know, people, various walks of life, professionals, uh, blue-collar people and so on, that have come in not only from Ottawa, but they're from Hamilton and uh, elsewhere mm -hmm. in the country that are here, St. Catharines. And uh, so they are trying to keep, keep the fire burning and keep uh, awareness of the issue. Uh, so when there, it really hits you, I guess, impresses you even more personally a, a, an impact because uh, this is not just some remote kind of thing to them. These are, these are blood and blood relatives that are, mm -hmm. you know, in these difficult, very uh, traumatic situations over there. So uh, it, it's quite, quite encouraging to see uh, people, faithful people like that, uh, that are there uh, day after day, you know, uh, takes a couple hours to do the setup and it can't be done by those who are on the fast because their physical condition is weaker but others that come in and faithfully do the setup so they have that protection from the elements uh, and as the weather's getting colding, colder even the more so a need for that you know mm -hmm. but uh, so I, I, I just think it's admirable that we have that kind of faithfulness and persistence hopefully it pays off and that there's some better media spotlight or attention on this uh, very tragic and traumatic issue. You know, Mr. Valicott, back in 2009, uh, during another hunger strike in front of the U.S. Embassy here in Ottawa, some of the protesters were told by the mainstream media that uh, their story is not a concern to the people in Ottawa. How do you feel about that when you hear something like this? The uh, issue of the media is saying that it's not an Ottawa concern or, or issue, it's not a I don't know if they're implying it's not a federal government concern, because I, I would quite disagree with that. And, and the media appropriately uh, brings attention when there's a typhoon in the Philippines and the tragic loss of life there, and there's an outpouring across the country in terms of helping and addressing that issue. Uh, you know, all kinds of donations come in and so on. So, so uh, obviously, when even more so when you've got a tragic kind of brutal assault on people and massacre, in the numbers there were at Camp Ashraf, who, that of course is a, an issue that the Canadian public should be uh, exposed to uh, tra the unsurpassing tragedy of it. It's something that the media should be concerned about and should be concerned about promoting and keeping us updated on and keeping the public generally aware of. I mean, obviously people within, within government and people that uh, make a point of following these things, mm -hmm. But the media's responsibility, I think, is to actually draw attention to these kinds of things that may otherwise not be known by the uh, uh, politicos and the, uh, you know, the government people, the uh, elected people and so on. It's to give the broader public a knowledge and an awareness and an update in respect to those things. Mm. Mr. Velikot, I know how concerned people are uh, regarding the fate of the seven hostages. How can we collectively, as Canadians, do more to free these uh, hostages? Right. Well, I, I, think, uh, I think, as I said before, I think letters in uh, driving the issue, like if a, po a politician, that's just the unfortunate way it sometimes works, but if, if they are, they got so many things doing, I think as we can appreciate and respect, and uh, they, they have long and full uh, days with all kinds of issues and uh, problems to sort out and, and things to resolve and address. So unless they are continually by way of letters and emails, I'd say good old-fashioned letters, either handwritten or typed up and sent to members. Uh, and you can't just do the CC because actually then, you know, they just know it's going to everybody and they'll, it'll be the person who's the primary addressee that they'll assume will take care of the issue or respond to it. Mm -hmm. But I think you need to be sending a, like a separate letter, even if it's the same wording to, to each, to members of parliament in the greater Ottawa. Uh, foreign affairs minister, uh, obviously I'm more than aware and conversant on this issue, uh, but I think that's the way that uh, Iranian Canadians and, and others that obviously share the uh, uh, sh share the hurt and share the uh, you know the devastation of this, I think they need to be saying, hey, let's press the United Nations to address this issue. Let's have our our uh, Canadian government uh, make statements on it and uh, and press the issue at the United Nations Forum as well. Uh, it's the public, uh, in addition to what's being done by way of that daily persistent uh, fast out there uh, in front of the U.S. Embassy. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, I would imagine our uh, Iranian friends in the U.S. are also making their representatives know, uh, know of and aware of and want to uh, 
get updates on this. Uh, but Canadians need to do it too. We can't uh, step away on the responsibility, and we need to write the letters, the emails, and so on to uh, and and see, in fact, if a person can set up an interview, uh, you know, with the uh, member of parliament, have a meeting in his office, if possible. But at, at a minimum, there needs to be the letters written, <clears throat> because as we say, and as we know right now, <clears throat> the media somehow is not giving the attention to. The, uh, the protest that goes on in front of the U.S. Embassy, so we've got to find additional other ways to, to get that on the radar of the public and on, on the radar of uh, local, but uh, politicians, particularly in the government party, but in the opposition a- as well. They need to be aware of this. Right. Mr. Valakad, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but on October 10th, the European Parliament adopted a resolution warning Iraq uh, if they don't honor their promises to protect the Ashraf residents, uh, then they will cut off uh, aid to Iraq. Um, on the other hand, I've heard that um, the U.S. congressmen are using the same language and warning Iraq. I'm just thinking out loud here, but is it something that our government in Canada is willing to pursue to put more pressure on the Iraqi government to free the hostages? I, I, I suppose it could be. I'm, I'm not exactly sure uh, where, uh, you know, where of these uh, particular issues to, or a way to address it, I guess, as in the other other situations there. I, I know that uh, the Americans, uh, because of uh, their considerable aid into Iraq, I don't know what the amount of our aid into there and to, to what effect that would uh, have impact, uh, but so, certainly uh, even if we have smaller amounts, uh, that is something that I guess potentially could be done. Uh, I guess the kind of opportunities within our Canadian parliamentary system would be through those that are members that are on the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, see if there might be the subcommittee of Foreign Affairs could possibly take up this issue and uh, give, give a look at it. Uh, and then if they write a report to that effect, then the larger, broader committee could as well. Um, we also have emergency debates in the Parliament of Canada. And uh, I think that generally comes by way of Foreign Affairs or you know a proposal, I guess, to the Speaker that there be a uh, emergent uh, kind of a discussion, if you will, or debate in the House of Commons. Um, I think that tends more to be when it's domestic type things in the mm-hmm. country that are emergent in nature, where the speaker, it's up to the speaker then to make a ruling, yes, we'll have some hour of debate, uh, you know, subsequent uh, in the week following, whatever evening. And uh, so there, there, there might be another possibility of that. But I, I've tended to find sometimes with the emergency debate things that, uh, depend, depending what it is, mm-hmm. it uh, may get its uh, hour of debate, and uh, sometimes there's not uh, beyond that. So it has to be a bunch of other things. Possibly, like I said, if, if somebody could, uh, you know, knowing a member of the, the committee, the subcommittee, I guess they are the ones that would maybe have some latitude in terms of a look at this issue too. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a critical issue, and it's a right. foreign affairs issue that I, I don't think uh, is just a one-off because we we have a regime there in Iraq. Uh, we have a regime in the neighboring country, obviously in Iran. Mm-hmm. Uh, the nuclear armament stuff. I mean, that's seizing the minds of leaders around the world. Right. Uh, and I think it's a very real threat. Uh, this stuff is not going to go away anytime soon. Mr. Velikot, it's a well-known fact that the Iraqi government doesn't permit any visitors to Camp Liberty, such as lawyers, the residents' family members, especially media, and not even doctors. Right. If you had the chance to talk to hunger strikers at Camp Liberty, what would you tell them? Well, I, I think I think it's necessary for them to persist. I think it's also there's got to be ways to, to kind of get that to the attention of the media because if it, it's kind of like if a tree falls in the forest and nobody hears it, uh, then, then it may not have had the impact. So if there's some faithful people there trying to bring attention uh, in terms of this terrible plight, mm-hmm. but somehow media is not picking up or we haven't found ways to have the media carry this very human, uh, compassionate story, then I, I think there needs to be some very critical look at uh, getting that story told. That's the important thing, because these are, these are individuals that are right in the thick of it, right in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. It's a human compassion story, uh, and, and yet that story needs to get out. So I, I admire those people. I, I certainly, from a distance here, having met the protesters, we've got some wonderful people here who stand in solidarity with them, and uh, are, they're not being forgotten. And, and yet, uh, somehow, we've got to find ways to break through into the public consciousness on this thing. Mr. Valikad, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for your time. 
You bet. My privilege. We'll uh, talk again sometime. Take care.